from the standpoint of the Southeast Asia program, the most legitimate motivation that you can have. In fact, I should say that the Southeast Asia program, when it first began, did not serve food. So there was food for thought, but not food for stomach. And uh, we have succumbed to uh, that incentive uh, over the intervening years. Uh, today is unusual in several respects. Um, Richard Hedarian, Richard Javad Hedarian, uh, is not a, uh, a new uh, guest uh, for the Southeast Asia program. In uh, 2017, he spoke here. Some of you may actually have attended his talk. And rather than develop a whole new uh, introduction, I really want to keep this very short because the most important thing is to hear what he has to say and to discuss it. But I will uh, quote just the first sentence of the blurb that we worked up back in 2017, which uh, has not altered in terms of its accuracy. Richard Javad Haydarian is the most prolific and interviewed geopolitical analyst currently writing and speaking, not only in the Philippines, but arguably in Southeast Asia as a whole. Uh, that's, that's high praise. Uh, why is Richard so well received? Um, let me hazard an answer that actually says more about what I think perhaps, uh, than what Richard said. Uh, we sometimes talk about pressing the envelope. That's a metaphor that crops up fairly often in academe, including in academe as it overlaps with the policy world. And pressing the envelope, of course, means expanding one's horizons of possibility. It puts a premium on creative ideas, on contrarian ideas, and on ideas that may actually be unrealistic. And here, in part, in relation to the policy world, is the optimism, or the hope, perhaps, better put, of putting unrealistic ideas and proposals on the table, not because they are going to happen, but because once they're on the table, they will be the subject of discussion, and that might reduce their improbability in the long run. Now, that's an academic uh, speaking in very <laughs> academic terms, I suppose, um, but that's, uh, that's where we are. We are inside academia at the moment. And Richard, his record of publication and commentary fits the press the envelope uh, metaphor beautifully. There's some who don't press the envelope, they just put a stamp on it, in the old days at least, and mail it, right? Or, or put it in a, in a computer and send it. And that's it, right? But Richard is a constant sort of discussion going on in progress with himself, with others, and it's in, in gratitude for that creativity that I am so happy to be able to invite him today. And the format is a little bit different also. He will give a few minutes of presentation, maybe 15, 20 minutes from the podium. And then after that, he and I will have a conversation. And then we'll open it for discussion with you. And thank you again for coming. Richard, thank, thank you, you for coming. Thank you very much, Don. Oh, let me time myself well. I want to abuse my welcome here. As I always say, uh, it's great to be here, especially during this kind of weather. It uh, feels like home because my mom comes from a part of the Philippines called Baguio, so it's in the mountains. It's quite like this. I don't know how I survive Manila's tropics. Probably that's why I'm half of the time out of the country. Uh, I always also can't help to quip that Stanford is a special place because everyone is busy to make the rest of the world useless and jobless. So I always look forward to see uh, what's the latest developing here and what is the state of mind. Uh, Don is easily among my favorite persons. Uh, I think we, we establish friendship more virtually to our works and uh, his emails are legendary for being, <laughs> being almost book-like, right, or at least monographs. And, uh, sometimes I worry, like, um, I feel so bad if my answer is just in a single paragraph. Uh, so, now, um, there was a joke about G.W. of Hegel uh, the great German philosopher, that he practically was writing the same book over and over again uh, on time, trying to capture uh, what uh, dialectical evolution and uh, change in the geist or consciousness of man is. 
in many ways, um, I think I've been struggling to do, having the same struggle <laughs> over the past few years, trying to understand not only what's happening in the geopolitical landscape, but also what's happening in terms of the leaders that are taking charge of the world. Uh, I, I'm a much more regular visitor on the other side, on the East Coast, but I would love to disturb you guys more often here. Uh, family's just down there in San Diego in California. Um, uh, I always joke that in, in, in DC nowadays feels more like home. It seems that the tree hasn't fallen too far from the lift. Uh, that the politics here and in, in Washington, in Manila and Washington DC are not too different. And I look forward to our question and answer and that uh, and conversation on that issue, especially with latest developments in our alliance. Uh, as I've been arguing in like, what, six or seven articles over the past week or so, um, President Duterte has effectively ended the century old alliance, unless we have another plot twist in the next 170 days. Because absent the visiting forces agreement between the United States and the Philippines, you essentially have the alliance as a CPU without an operating system because the VFA was a software, the legal framework that allowed for the entry and exit of American troops. But today I'm here not to talk about only the Philippines and the U.S. alliance, but broadly the competition between U.S. and China across what is now called the Indo-Pacific. I think here, or especially in East Coast, everyone talks about the Indo-Pacific, but in Southeast Asia, it's a little bit touchy. In fact, I struggled to get um, folks from Southeast Asia to endorse not the book per se, but just the title, like, oh, in the Pacific, that sounds a little bit more like containment strategy. Personally, in the Pacific is close to me. Um, uh, you know, from my mom's side, I have, you know, the Hispanic people who, conquistadors who came over in Southeast Asia. I have a little bit of Chinese blood. My dad comes from the Caspian region, and I got to know from my granddad we may have even Central Asian blood. So in the Pacific is more or less also where genetically I've been, uh, I can find my roots. And I try to understand and break down what is this in the Pacific and what is the future of geopolitics in the most important pivotal region of the world. <coughs> now, to make it much more interesting, because that book is around 400 pages uh, from my reports and analysis from Egypt uh, before the Arab Spring, all the way to the latest development uh, in the Philippines uh, and, and Washington, D.C., I felt to make it a little bit sexier, I wanted to go against the grain in terms of what are the myths that I keep on hearing about the future of Asia. I think one of the most prevalent myths that I hear, not only among policymakers but also journalists and a lot of academics, unfortunately, is this idea of inevitability, quite similar to technological inevitabilism that we hear a lot here in Stanford. This idea that the future of Asia belongs to China, uh, and the question is whether we're going to have a Pax Sinica or a much more chaotic version of that. My argument, um, based on the years of scholarship and journalism, and last year I was lucky because I was a visiting scholar at National Science University in Taiwan, and I got to talk also to President Tsai and top officials there, and I got to observe the elections there and China's influence there, is that China's power in many ways is overestimated. And I think it's not, it's not hard to understand that, especially in light of what's happening with the, you know, the coronavirus and epidemic on the verge of a pandemic, unfortunately, uh, so I call this the Chernobyl effect. This is what, when you concentrate power and when the system is highly centralized and you don't have transparency, unfortunately cover-ups or Chernobyl-like kind of disasters are inevitable. Um, so, and at the same time, of course, you can look at it from a different way and say, well, China is going to overcome this the same way that it overcame SARS, but what is much more uh, of a geopolitical earthquake is how the United States key allies in the region are essentially falling apart, or actually falling on China's lap. And I think no country captures this more dramatically. I mean, we Filipinos are dramatic people, but I think what we're doing right now is almost telenovela level, is how <laughs> President Duterte has, is effectively ending the alliance, and all Donald Trump has to say is, I'm fine with that, we're gonna save a lot of money. I mean, this is the perfect storm that I think the alliance perhaps needed, right? And now, of uh, the adults in the room, right? The alliance managers are really scratching their heads. So it's a countdown. I think it's like 170 days more. Let's see if there's going to be another plot twist, which I'm not going to rule out. But as things stand, I think it's very clear uh, that the Philippines is not the same Philippines. In fact, back in 2017, I said, if there's any revolution that President Duterte has introduced into Philippine foreign policy, is that our relationship with the United States went from almost zero to five percent kind of like Israel-US relationship to highly transactional. And when you have a transactional logic, at some point President Duterte 
perhaps calculated that there's no point in keeping the alliance. Now, historians make a distinction between lingerie, not lingerie, uh, lingerie, long term, and even mentiel, short term analysis. So it's like an ocean, right? I think a lot of us, when we try to understand the future of Asia and China's influence here, we look at the surface of the ocean, the surface movements, the big waves, and we get a little bit impressed with that. What I've been trying to do in different books, including my latest projects, uh, is to look at the deep ocean movements, the tectonic movements there. And I think that's where you see much more vulnerability in terms of China's rise in Asia. In fact, my argument is that China will not dominate Asia most likely in the 21st century. Therefore, I use the not so PC term of premature hegemony. I use a much more PC term, inchoate hegemony, in, with Carnegie and Tsinghua, but I'm just going to use a uh, premature one. Now, when it comes to our understanding of uh, China uh, and its rise, I think you can classify countries depending on where they are on the Kubler Strauss grief cycle. I think some countries, like Taiwan, are definitely in the acceptance stage and they're dealing with it in a very robust manner. And then you have countries literally in bargaining position, like Prime Minister Mahathir of Malaysia, who has been bargaining for concessions on the infrastructure investments of China. And then you have countries like the Philippines, which is stuck between a president in complete denial about the threat from China, and people are extremely angry about that situation. So you have also countries with almost a split situation. I, I really felt that this grief cycle analysis helps us to understand how we deal not necessarily with the rise of China, because there are many positive aspects with the rise of China, but the worst instance <coughs> of China and how that affects smaller countries and their quest for freedom and democracy. Now, I think there are two thinkers, there are many thinkers, um, that help you understand what is the implication of the rise of China and, and why Southeast Asia feels it the most. I think one of them is, without question, Prime Minister Li. Not that you know, he's always right, I didn't agree with him all the time, but I think one of his greatest observations is how we capture the essence of what the rise of China would mean in ways that cannot be understood in uh, other historical parallels, let's say rise of Kaiser's Germany or rise of imperialist Japan. Um, his argument was that the size of China's display of the world balance is such that the world must find a new balance. In short, China is so huge that its re-emergence is going to change the entire game. So we're not talking about tactical balance of power adjustments, as we perhaps we could have avoided Second or First World War if we adjusted to the rise of Germany or Japan, some would even say. But China is just so big, right, that the whole system will change. And it's in Southeast Asia, supposed historical backyard of China, that we're feeling this systemic shock more than ever. In many ways, it's an acid test of what the future will look like under Chinese hegemony. <coughs> I think the other great thinker that I have a lot of respect for was Walter Benjamin, uh, the German philosopher and linguist, uh, unfortunately died on, on his way escaping Nazi Germany, he said, behind every fascism, there's a failed revolution. And this is where I'm a, more of a minority view in ASEAN, quite uh, not the most popular guy among certain circles, because for me, the fascism we're talking about is not China per se, although what's happening in Xinjiang is extremely troubling, among others. But the fascism is the return of great power rivalry, almost naked great power rivalry in East Asia. And the failed revolution for me is our inability to create Kantian perpetual peace through robust multilateral institutions. And this is where I blame ASEAN. I think in, in ASEAN could have done way better than it has been doing. Although, of course, you have to give credit where credit is due. I think I still prefer what we have in Southeast Asia than what I've seen in other regions of the world, like the Middle East, when essentially it's a Game of Thrones situation. When it's not even Sunni versus Shia, it's Wahhabi versus Wahhabi. I mean, Qatar and Saudi situation is mind-boggling. So in fairness, I mean, first of all, to ASEAN, I think we have to give them credit where credit is due. We have established over the past six decades what constructivists would call a security regime, right? Or a security community whereby the use or even the threat of use of force as an instrument of foreign policy is unthinkable. This is not a region that was very peaceful not a long time ago. John should know about this very well. I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just saying you're an expert in the region. So from the confront of the years in the 1960s, in fact, one of the most amazing documents I came across when I was doing a Wikileaks uh, books was, uh, there was, I think, a time when Najib Razak's father 
had to message the Brits. The Brits had to talk to Kissinger. Kissinger had to talk to Nixon. Nixon had to talk to Marcos of the Philippines in the 1960s not to invade Sabah. They were really scared of the Philippines back in the days, right? The situation was extremely similar to what you see in parts of the Middle East today. And from there to what we have today, whereby we still have maritime disputes, we still have territorial disputes, we still have non-traditional concerns like the haze coming from Indonesia and making it unlivable in other places like Singapore and Malaysia at some point in the year, we still do not resort to force. The closest we came to this was in uh, early 2010s when Cambodia and Thailand had some mobilization, uh, Kutzpah, I would rather say, on their border over a disputed temple. But the case was eventually taken to international adjudication under the uh, inspiration or push by the Indonesia. So we have a very significant improvement in terms of overall condition in Southeast Asia. The ASEAN free trade was negotiated ahead of time. We have a lot of non-traditional security cooperation, including coordinated patrols in the Sulu Celebes Seas, tri-borders of Philippines, Malaysia, and, uh, and, and Indonesia, especially in light of the ISIS threats. But I think the most important thing with, with ASEAN is the convening power, right? On our own, each Southeast Asian country may not be such a major force, although <coughs> Thailand can be against that later on. But ASEAN is where we can bring great powers together. I think one of the my favorite pictures is the picture of Trump, Abe, Modi, all of these top leaders in Barong Tagalog, Filipino, when they were in Manila and doing kind of a quad meeting, right? That was that was really something, right? To watch that. Uh, ironically, most quadrilateral meetings have been in Manila, if I'm not mistaken, over the years. Now, nonetheless, you know, as Arthur Miller would put it, an era can be considered over when its basic illusions have been exhausted. I think our earlier success was kind of a curse. It gave us overconfidence that we could shape relationship among great powers. I'm mean, being a sabotage again. Um, and this is where comes my argument against ASEAN as it stands today. I think ASEAN is suffering what you can call like a middle institutionalization trap. It's kind of similar to middle income trap, right? The basic logic behind middle income trap is that the set of policies that allow a country to go from low income to middle income is not gonna work for you if you wanna move forward to the high income. In the same way, the decision-making processes and modalities that allow the ASEAN to go from a confront disease, semi-Cold War situation in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s to a much more peaceful security regime is not gonna be sufficient for ASEAN to deal with new geopolitical realities, especially the rise of China and the impending competition or existing competition uh, with the United States. Now, in, in ASEAN, we talk about two principles of Mushawara and Muafakat. They're actually Arabic terms. If you're familiar a little bit with Arabic, you would know that the notion of Mushawara, and especially Muafakat, is more close to how the European Union understands Muafakat, right? Consensus is not necessarily all of us being 100% on the same issue all the time, right? It's more or less working out something together. It's how the tribal chiefs in Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula have been dealing with, uh, with issues and problems over the centuries. The problem in the ASEAN is that our understanding of that is essentially unanimity. And that makes it almost impossible for us to come up with a robust position on issues where at least one major great power, right, has an incentive to ensure we are not unified. Now, this is where I also take issue with a lot of friends in ASEAN who, who love to do Cambodia bashing. Because Cambodia has been blamed for creating <coughs> ASEAN division uh, on the issue, for instance, of South China Sea, where China doesn't want multilateral response, but wants to pick countries apart. My problem is that if you have unanimity-based decision-making process, Effectively, each member of the ASEAN has a veto power, whether you like it or not. That means that if you're Cambodia and you have effectively a veto power and perhaps one third of your national budget comes from China, China is gonna pressure you no matter what, either directly or indirectly. We saw a more brazen version of that back in 2012 and then a more stealthy version of that in 2015 and 16. I remember very well Prime, uh, Prime Minister, right? Hun Sen, in 2015, just before the Philippine arbitration came out, he was extremely emotional. He said, Cambodia should not have, should not even bother with this issue of South China Sea, especially the arbitration issue, right? For him, this is an issue that Cambodia has no direct interest. But essentially, he was saying that I'm under pressure to vote in a certain way, even though I don't want to have to say anything about it. So this is a problem with unanimity-based decision-making process. It's unfair, because countries with, with no direct interest will be put under pressure 
And that could mean alienating some other countries in the region and beyond, which is exactly the kind of dilemma that Cambodia found itself on. Now, it's so bad that, you know, ASEAN sometimes only has one job, and that one job is to come up with a robust statement. And China, caring about its face and soft power, and because leadership is authority, cares about statements. But even statements sometimes the ASEAN cannot get it through, precisely because we cannot almost structurally get a unanimity on certain issues. This is not only in South China Sea, even the issue of Rohingya, uh, ethnic cleansing in Myanmar, obviously the Myanmar government was against it. So you see this troubling trend whereby more and more ASEAN countries are releasing what they call a chairman statement. A chairman statement essentially means there was no consensus, so the chairman will try to put together the majority view, right? Or the semi-consensus view. So this is a situation we're facing today. Now, with this uh, institutional paralysis that ASEAN is facing today, we're moving towards what I call it cult of dialogue. I mean, it's really frustrating to see that ASEAN you see, every three years or four years, we say, oh, we are moving towards a code of conduct in the South China Sea. Now we have a title. And then after three years, now we have an outline. Now we have a draft of a final outline. I mean, it's almost a ridiculous show, right? Going on and on. And, and the problem is that, you know, ASEAN is just enjoying the ride rather than looking at the destination, right? But even more troubling, and this is where I blame the Philippines, particularly under President Duterte, is that we're moving from Asian centrality to peripherality because under President Duterte, by the way, he was a chairman of Asia in 2017, and now the Philippines is the ASEAN China country coordinator. So it oversees all bilateral important deals, especially in code of conduct in South China Sea between China and ASEAN. Uh, President Duterte did something different because for a long time our concern was ASEAN is too divided to stand up to China. But what happened in 2017 is ASEAN actually became a shield for China against external powers. I'll give you an anecdote. I remember during the ASEAN Regional Forum, our Foreign Secretary, uh, Alan Peter Cayetano, he's Speaker of the House in my run for presidency. Uh, there are memes about him as Ambassador Ko Yi Tan Ho, of course, you can imagine why. Um, I remember him saying, because Australia, United States, and Japan released a trilateral statement saying the arbitration award of 2016 is final and binding. Therefore, China should abide by that. Interestingly, our foreign sector effectively came out. Uh, this is not direct quotation. Kind of saying like, it is our sovereign right not to assert our sovereign right. Like, effectively, he was criticizing other countries to put pressure on the Philippines to stand up to China and assert that. That was crazy. But what was even more worrying was towards the end in November, President Duterte said, the South China Sea disputes should be left untouched by external powers. So essentially saying, leave it between us and China, you other countries get out. This never happened under previous uh, chairmen of ASEAN, not even under Cambodia. The Cambodian position is, let's just not talk about it. But President Duterte said, no, 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 this is between us. And in fact, he told the Chinese line, which is the situation is generally stable. This is a, this is a talking point you hear from China's foreign ministry all the time. That was extremely troubling for me. and. This is it. President Duterte and so-called pragmatists in the region argue that if you play nice with China, you do not assert international law, you don't bring in external powers, or, as, or leverage your alliances with the United States, among others, against China, China is going to be nice to you. Unfortunately, the evidence on the ground suggests the complete opposite. In fact, since President Duterte became the president of the Philippines, and since he had this, uh, he called for a meek and humble diplomacy towards China, we see militarization of the disputes. Even further, you saw the deployment of surface air missiles, anti-cruise ballistic missiles, electronic jamming equipment, and even more troublingly, the Chinese Coast Guard is now under the PLA Navy, so there's no even distinction between Great Hall and White Hall in that sense. In fact, even more troubling,ly over the past year or so, we see the militiaization of the disputes, whereby China is more aggressively using militia forces to push the envelope and harass other countries. So the situation actually has dramatically deteriorated. You know, as we always joke, if you give the, I mean, I mean the communist part of China, you give them an inch, they'll ask for the whole hand. And this is very much the situation we see on the ground. Now, I have limited time, so I'm just going to go to the crux of the counter-argument. Now, as depressing as the situation seems, there are three arguments to still doubt whether China will dominate the situation. You see, I come from the Philippines, one of our icons is Manny Pacquiao, right? So if this is boxing, I don't see a knockout anytime soon. I think we're just in round three and four. I've been writing on South China for 10 years, don't even longer than that. So I think we're still just in round three and four. So I don't like this kind of strategic fatalism 
I'm hearing from a lot of friends that China is going to dominate South China Sea and it's over. First of all, I think a lot of people people have a mistaken epistemology. The way we measure power is wrong because we look at gross indicators. Everyone looks at the total defense spending of China. Okay, you can make it PPP, so times 2.5. You can look at the Chinese GDP and be very impressed about that. But the correct way of really analyzing whether a country, how powerful a country is, and whether it can project power beyond its immediate borders, is to look at what Michael Beckley called the net power. So asset minus liabilities. I think many people forget about the liabilities that the Chinese government has to deal with, including domestic challenges. Now, that's an entire lecture in itself, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. So a nation's power stems not from its gross resources, but from its net resources. And if you look at many key indicators, the United States is still way ahead of China, whether in terms of patents in biotechnology, whether in terms of per capita income, whether in terms of natural resources, its ecological balance, its human capital. And in fact, contrary to the projection of, I think, IMF and a lot of experts, we still do not see the Chinese economy overlapping with, China, with US. Because you know, US GDP is far larger than China, I think around 30%, so it has to grow it doesn't have to grow 6%, right? Like China, it can go 2 or 3% and could more or less keep that edge. And we're not even talking about per capita income, which is a more important way of looking at the quality of life and living standards. Now, nonetheless, of course, there are people like Kai Fu Li who have been arguing that in artificial intelligence, though, China is making huge strides. I think he divided artificial intelligence to seven fields, and his argument is that in three fields, China is getting ahead of everyone. But those are the fields whereby China's advantage is not because of innovation, but because it has access to so much data without privacy loss. So it's a regulatory rather than an innovation-based advantage. But in other areas which is more based on innovation, Silicon Valley more, the US still has an edge on that. Now, there's a lot of Trump bashing also going on, and I agree with a lot of that. I think in the Middle East, the policy of Trump administration is not something that I would really endorse. But in fairness, in East Asia, at least, we see much more robust pushback against China, which we didn't see under the previous administration. We have more regularized freedom of navigation operations, including in areas which were not covered in the past, like Scarborough Shoal. Sometimes you even have two American warships entering within the Chinese 12 nautical miles of the artificial islands, things that we didn't see under the Obama administration. And, we had, and you see more frequency. I think last year there were five or six freedom of navigation operations by the United States. The other one is expansion of regional military footprint and defense cooperation. In fact, we don't see that only with uh, Philippines, which got even more foreign military financing under the Trump administration, but also with new strategic partners like Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia. This reach out is continuing with even greater force under the Trump administration, although it was not completely original to that administration. The other one is the US Coast Guard. It's not more directly involved right now in almost freedom of navigation operations, not only in South China Sea, but also in the Taiwan Straits. So now, I think for the first time since the end of Cold War, you have both the US Coast Guard and the US Navy doing uh, access operations in the area, and they're also building capacity among smaller countries. And then you have the Build Infrastructure Initiative with $60 billion. Not much development on that, but I, th I think that there's at least a recognition that US has to have a say in terms of infrastructure development. Now, the paradox here is that precisely because of unpredictability of President Trump and concern about his reliability, you also see another interesting phenomenon. Before that, let's just look at some numbers. So despite extreme unpopularity of President Trump or a huge collapse in, in, in trust in America's leadership to do the right thing in countries like Japan and Korea, I think we're at 40, 50 points. Nonetheless, in many countries in Asia, the United States is still preferred as a world leader. Now that shows a lot of endurance in terms of American soft power that in spite of having its current leadership, which can still change, you know, um, we still have this endurance of American power. So I think the numbers are very clear on that. And interestingly, if you look at surveys by ICS, not ISIS, uh, Institute for Southeast Asian Studies, it shows that there's also a lot of skepticism about China's Belt and Road Initiative and China's influence in the region. Which brings me to the other issue, because interestingly, when ASEAN countries are asked which is the most preferred external power, it's neither US nor China, it's Japan. Japan consistently has one of the highest approval ratings among ASEAN countries, despite the history of Imperial Japan uh, in that region. Um, and more importantly, why Japan is not seen as great power on the global landscape in Southeast Asia, and East Asia, 
I mean, it's still the third largest economy. It has the most advanced and biggest navy in Asia, right? And it is a big player in terms of infrastructure development. Everyone talks about BRI of China, but it's actually the Japanese who are making a lot of investment in this region. So if you look at the raw numbers, in key countries like Indonesia, Philippines, especially in Vietnam, the rising power of ASEAN, Japan is way ahead of China, not in stock, but in new infrastructure projects. There's almost no competition. In Philippines, you're talking about eight Chinese projects, assuming they'll come into force, versus 29 Chinese projects. In Vietnam, we're talking about 74 Japanese projects versus 25. So here you can clearly see the edge that Japan has. That's on top of the fact that Japan has been the top investor in infrastructure and industrialization of many Southeast Asian countries. So interestingly, the Chinese seem to be better capitalists. They get more bang out of imaginary box sometimes. While it seems Japan and United States and other countries are not doing a good job of reminding people of pre-existing and forthcoming infrastructure projects. Now, you can also see that it's not only Japan, but also other countries like Australia and India are also moving to this picture because infrastructure is now the new pivot of geopolitical competition. Now, the issue here is not to match renminbi by renminbi. Maybe China can outspend, assuming their projects are gonna really come uh, into fruition. But this is about also rules of the game. What many countries in Southeast Asia are concerned about, and much of the world, is what you call debt trap, right? And debt trap, I mean, as much as we want infrastructure development, we want it in a sustainable way, both financially and environmentally. And also the other concern is what uh, experts call corrosive capital. When Chinese capital comes in, some is positive, some is great. Some is almost indispensable and needed, especially in what you can call, uh, for lack of a better term, fourth world countries or frontier markets. <coughs> but the reality is that when Chinese money tends to come in, capital comes in, it also distorts, right, good governance practices. And we see that in a lot of different countries. In the Philippines, our war is this. You're not seeing a lot of infrastructure projects but you're seeing a lot of Chinese online casino coming in, and we know that these are then for illicit activities. I mean, for m sakes, these guys are even bringing their own prostitutes. I mean, it's getting out of control there. Um, and interestingly, based on satellite imagery, all of these pogos, online casinos, are next to military bases in Manila, which is quite interesting. And uh, under President Duterte, we have given the Chinese more jobs than the Chinese could ever give us, probably. I think we have employed 500 or 600,000 Chinese in our country. So, this is a very interesting situation we're looking at. But I think the other thing we have to look at is so-called smaller powers. Now, I've been talking to leaders and all. I have a picture with Duterte, but I don't have the picture with my book. Um, <laughs> um, the thing is this. I think, first of all, are Southeast Asian countries all of them small? I would say countries like Indonesia are already middle powers. They're G20 countries. Vietnam and the Philippines are on the verge of becoming middle powers and trillion dollar economies with more than 100 million population. But the other thing you have to keep in mind is also public opinion. Like, Philippines is, I think, the most interesting case, again, not because I come from the Philippines, is because you have almost a schizophrenic situation, whereby you have the most openly pro-China leader you can imagine anywhere in the world. Sorry to Hun Sen, the gold medal of loyalty goes to Duterte. Uh, and there, there's a flare of quotes I can give you to back that up. Uh, in fact, Pres uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi called President Duterte the most trusted friend of China, right? I mean. I mean, that, that says a lot. But the interesting thing is that in, in public opinion, China's numbers even went down in, in recent months. So while the United States approval ratings are in the, this is net approval ratings, by the way, is in the plus 73 territory, that of China reached negative, actually it's 33, the latest I got in November, uh, fourth quarter of last year. So you see this huge kind of gap between what the leadership may have been thinking and what the people think. Now, what is the relevance of that? The relevance of that is exactly what we have been seeing in Sri Lanka, in Philippines in 2010, and in case of Malaysia in 2018. If the public doesn't like China or has reservations about that, you may be able to call up the current leadership, but the next leadership or the same leadership might change tone in the next electoral cycle. The, the reality is that although Southeast Asia is not home to the most robust democracies, as an element of responsiveness to public opinion is almost sine qua non for the legitimacy and survival of any regime. So it's not just based on development performance, economic performance, but a certain degree of sensitivity to public opinion, which cannot be denied even in the not so democratic countries in the region. Now this is the numbers in the Philippines. It's just amazing how the third is out of sync with his own people. When people were asked should the Philippines assert its arbitration award and take back some of the islands by China, 
9 out of 10 Filipinos said yes. We can have a completely different lecture about whether President Duterte's popularity is credible or not. I mean, we can go to the number, but this is a totally different issue. But I think President Duterte's other big problem is that where is the money? Where is the Chinese investments that we promised for the Philippines? If you go now to the Philippines, the two biggest infrastructure projects are subway to be built by the Japanese and the north-south commuters highway, which is still going to be built by Japanese connecting the most industrious regions of the country. Interestingly, President Duterte has been pushing back against our alliance with the United States, and yet, in the past two or three years, we saw even more joint military exercises and more countries involved in American-US joint military exercises, including Japan and Australia. In fact, last year, the two countries conducted 280 joint military activities, more than any American Indo-Pacific partner. This year, the schedule was 318. So Duterte is not only going against public opinion on the question of China and US relations, but he's also going against what is the status quo between the Philippine defense establishment and the United States. I think that's something very important uh, to keep in mind. But the other interesting thing is to see Mahathir. I interviewed him last year. It's fascinating. I said, when I was younger, I knew you for being uh, the anti-Western, you know, bashing guy, right? And yet it was so surreal to hear him talk about Chinese-like kind of new imperialism. In fact, inside the People's Great Hall in Beijing, he talked about new colonialism as a threat. I mean, that guy has quite some audacity, and he got away with it. And when he came to Manila, I got him on the record to warn about, you know, that you know, Chinese investments could be good, but there are certain things we have to be worried about. And immediately there was a response from Malacanian. Now, what's very interesting with Mahathir is this. So for first six to eight months of his uh, uh, return to power, he aggressively negotiated, he got concessions, uh, around five to six billion dollars, some <coughs> estimates, on the Chinese infrastructure project. And then suddenly, around <coughs> April, May, June, July, he became nice to China. And then when there were questions about Huawei and 5G and all, they said, hey, come on, everyone spies, so what? There's nothing to spy in Malaysia. So suddenly people said, oh, okay, so Mahathir folded. Now, interestingly, last December, I was in China, last December, <coughs> January, I was in China, oh, I was uh, in Sanya, Hainan, uh, President Xi Jinping just launched the new Shandong new aircraft carrier. There was a lot of festivity. And boom, the next morning, I see my Chinese counterpart friends with some sobering face. And they come to me and says, what do you think about what Malaysia just did? So apparently, Malaysia submitted at the United Nations its extended continental shelf claim jutting northwards. This is different from the one jutting westwards with Vietnam in 2008 and 9, which actually kind of provoked the tensions in the region, and the Chinese were very worried about it. Interestingly, if you look at the document, it's dated May 2017. That meant that the previous administration sat on it, and that it was conceptualized not long after the Philippines Arbitration Award. Now, if you look at the, the, the CLCS, Document Forward to United Nations, it builds on the Philippine Arbitration Award, which made it very clear that the Nine Dash Line has no basis in international law. This is a very interesting thing. And within that month or so, we saw not only Malaysia, which, by the way, called Nine Dash Line ridiculous, very interestingly. And in fact, Foreign Minister Saifuddin openly said, we don't want to deal with China on bilateral basis. We have to deal with them on a multilateral basis. Vietnam in November also openly talked about filing arbitration award. Now, there is some twist here, uh, Don. Um, I love Vietnamese. They're very good friends of mine. But a part of me is very disappointed with them because I know... Back in the days when we were going to fight the arbitration awards, they gave us a sense that they're going to do a parallel arbitration case against China. So they kept on inviting Filipino experts. They kept on saying, we're with you and all. And in the end, we ended up like the guinea pigs, right? <laughs> we were on our own, more or less, in ASEAN. And a few countries outside stood by us. <clears throat> so some people in the Philippines, quite cynically, would say that, you know, you guys were not with us back in the day. Maybe now it's time for us to juice out the Chinese and get some deal. You know, this kind of mindset is very strong among a lot of observers in the Philippines. And it's hard to criticize that. And I openly say this to our Vietnamese friend. You had a good chance when the Philippines had the most determined China skeptic government, right? We filed the arbitration award. If this went one, two punch, the effect would have been much more dramatic. And yet Vietnam didn't do that. But now at least, Vietnam as the ASEAN chair, you see, 10 years ago when, uh, when Vietnam was the ASEAN chair, we saw a huge sea change. This was the time when Hillary Clinton said, South China Sea is national interest. Uh, freedom of navigation in South China Sea is national interest. You saw the uh, Yang TT uh, speech about your your small, we're big, and all of that. We may expect another political earthquake this year, and the Vietnamese are not very happy with the situation, especially in light of the five-month standoff over the Vanguard Bank last year. But even more interestingly is the case of Indonesia. Now, Joko Widodo, 
if you follow the elections in Indonesia, you know, he's, he's always criticized, uh, sometimes even as being ethnically Chinese, you know, this kind of racist slur going on in Indonesia. Um, and we know that President Jokowi is your, your quintessential developmentalist president, right? Infrastructure development comes first and foremost. And yet even he couldn't ignore the backlash at home in light of China's movements within the Tuna Islands in last December, in 